Hello, you're very welcome to uh, Virtual Drumconda Library. My name is Emma Kelly and I'm the branch manager in Drumconda Library um, and I'm delighted to be hosting tonight. So um, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to introduce you to Jerry Farrell, our speaker. Uh, so Jerry is a, a local man. He lives up the road from Drumconda Library and he's um a, a, a football buff um i would say mostly bohemian so please forgive him some of you might recognize him from uh trips to daily mount or talca park um, and the reason we went with uh jerry for this talk tonight is we gave a talk um in january 2020 on ray kyo who played for Drumcondra fc and ray was uh one of the first um black people to play, mixed race people to play uh, in League of Ireland. Um, drums have a lot of firsts and I'm sure Jerry will cover some of them tonight and you'll probably be aware of them. And also uh, this event has been recorded. So if you know anybody that's training this evening, uh, tell them not to panic. They'll be able to see the recording later. Okay, Jerry. Thanks for that, Emma. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, just a few quick thank yous. I want to say a big thank you to Emma and everyone in Drumcondra Library. Uh, as she said, uh, I did do a talk there, what seems like a few years ago now, but it was actually only January of last year on Ray Kyo. And, um, I'm, you know, he was, uh, as I say, a pioneer, uh, not quite the first black player in the League of Ireland. Um, although I, I have a few pieces about that. Uh, it is Black History Month as well. Uh, just to say as well, I do write a lot about Bohemians, as Emma said, but I, I do try and cover everything uh, within Irish football. So I, I write for various different publications. The uh, write for the Irish uh, national team match programs. You may have seen a few pieces in there. I do have a blog and a podcast as well, which I promise isn't just all Bose content. There's a lot of stuff, including quite a few uh, articles on Drumcondra uh, FC. And you should even my dad played for Bose uh, as well. But prior to playing for Bose, he played for Drumcondra as well back in the early 60s. Um, I'm going to share a screen. Uh, I have some nice uh, images here. I promise it's not going to be death by PowerPoint. Um, and just before that, I just want to say thanks again to the people in the Dublin Festival of History, uh, Dublin City Council Library Service, um, for all the support and encouragement, uh, and especially to Emma as well, and, and to Kate and everyone else who's been so helpful uh, in basically arranging this talk. So I'm going to share the screen now without too much further ado. Uh, hopefully it comes up okay. I'm hoping people can see that. Uh, if not, uh, do let me know. Um, so if you can see that there, there's a, a nice picture there of uh, Drumcondra side from the early 1960s. They were uh, league champions around that era. Um, and yeah, we'll move on. So to begin, before Drumcondra FC, there was football in Drumcondra, uh, quite a lot of football. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, record that was uh, flagged to me by my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Michael Keelty, that as far back as 1774, there is a newspaper report about uh, football uh, in Drumcondra. Uh, it's not very complimentary. In fact, a lot of the early reports of uh, uh, football in the area are not at all uh, complimentary about football. Uh, it is kind of seen as something that's uh, causing problems and things like that. So the original report, that 1774 report, uh, recorded in Saunders newsletter, an early newspaper at the time, said much damage was done by the breaking down of fences and the trampling of the grass by the groups playing football. Now, what they were playing as football, kind of versus the folk football that had been common at the time, bears very little resemblance to what we would now know as association football or indeed any other code of football. But there were these kind of folk matches, especially played around um, springtime, often associated with uh, events like Shrove Tuesday and things like that. Um, as Drumcondra developed as a suburb, uh, as the city grew, and as a lot of the areas that anyone around Drumcondra would know uh, were developed in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, um, I suppose it, it, it developed more and more of a sporting codes and sporting associations. By 1864, there's a guy Alderman Morris Butterley, um, who leased 21 acres near Jones's Road in Drumcondra. And those areas would be known as the city and suburban sports grounds, or sometimes Butterley's city and suburban sports grounds. And they could be hired out for a variety of sports. So we had everything from uh, soccer, rugby, GAA, athletics, uh, even some sort of uh, horse racing at times uh, taking place on those locations. Now, of course, we know that location much more uh, now as Crow Park, 
But I just point out there that, uh, say, for example, Bohemians were one of the teams that actually played on Jones Road for about three years in the 1890s. Uh, it wasn't until, I think, 1913, actually, that uh, the GAA uh, basically came into sole ownership of what we now know today as Crow Park. Um, and just say like, there was an awful lot of uh, clubs being formed in that period. So what you have is a developing city and developing suburbs. Um, and with that, uh, there's also developments in, say, labor laws and things like that. So people begin to get uh, you know, half day on a Saturday. So if you're working, you could finish on a half day and then you had a little bit of free time. And the 19th century sees the emergence of what we kind of call association culture, people joining clubs and societies, not just sporting clubs, often, you know, debating societies or literary societies, things like that. But sports became more and more popular as people had things like spare time. They had access to an emerging transport network with the railways, which obviously uh, serviced city centre and then eventually after Drumcondra as well. Um, so very, very quickly in the late 19th century, you see an explosion in the amount of sports clubs in and around Drumcondra. A huge number is in Drumcondra, Glasnevin, uh, you know, out to Ballybock and et cetera. So there's an awful lot of clubs emerging. And one of those clubs is uh, a club called Drumcondra FC. So uh, my best guess is they were formed in late 1896. Um, they do appear uh, you know, from, from then on as well. Now, this Drumcondra FC, and something I'll go through in this talk, is like, what relationship do they bear to the current uh, and su subsequent versions of Drumcondra FC? There are, you know, there's a couple of Drumcondras at the moment. There's a Drumcondra AFC, there's a Drumcondra FC. They have teams playing in different leagues. They have senior teams, they have junior teams and so on. Um, you know, who were this club? Who was this club? Um, and I'll cut on to the next slide and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this a little bit further. Um, so the early Drumcondra club, um, I suppose fans of drums and I, I suspect many people on the call associate uh, Drumcondra FC with Richmond Road and with Talca Park. Uh, whereas the original Drumcondra FC, sometimes called Drumcondra Botanic, uh, are probably more associated with the other side of Drumcondra rather than the Richmond Road side, they're probably, uh, their, their grounds were around Botanic Road. Um, as one report says, uh, formerly uh, on the grounds of Santry Rugby Club. So they begin, or as I say, around 1896. We have uh, fixtures for them playing in uh, 1897 in the Leinster Junior League. In 1898, there's a notice of uh, an AGM with the election of key positions. So we have Jack Ryder, uh, elected as honorary secretary. Uh, he's living on Drumcondra Road. Um, and they're winners of the Junior League, the first kind of major uh, title in 1899. Now, just to mention that man, Jack Ryder, he would later go on to have a very significant role um, in the FAI, and he's hugely significant around the time of the split from the IFA, uh, and he's very significant in the Leinster Football Association, which is basically the governing body for football in Dublin, and obviously the rest of the province of Leinster. The other image I've shown there, the kind of uh, very dapper looking gentleman in the bow tie, and from the newspaper sketch, uh, is Lawrence Sheridan or Larry Sheridan. Again, he lived uh, up on Whitworth Road and he's the honorary secretary of Drumcondra AFC. Now, uh, we use the phrase secretary and things like that. Se secretaries are uh, kind of in, in the time and still occasionally nowadays, uh, generally uh, what we would consider maybe uh, a managing director or CEO in the modern parlance. They were generally the club secretary, the honorary secretary were generally the, the key person in the club in terms of getting stuff done. And Larry Sheridan is, is again, also uh, a crucially important person. He gets very involved in the uh, Lens Football Association, which was formed in uh, 1892. And then he's very involved. He's elected a number of committees on the IFA. And then even after the split from the IFA, he's very involved with the FAI. So you can already see there that drums have hugely influential um, figures in football administration in Dublin involved and okay a lot of these players uh, a lot of these people as well as administrators were also players so we know say larry sheridan played for drums as well as uh being coming a hugely important person in terms of the administration of the club and football generally in dublin so you already have two very important people involved in this club literally by the turn of the 20th century um this is where things uh, become a bit more difficult and it's hard to track the exact history of uh, drums say from the turn of the century up until 1924, when the drum conjurer that most of you are, who are uh, here at this talk came along to hear of it. So traditionally that, that club, the club that you know, won FAI Cups and league titles and had the great rivalry with Shamrock Rovers and all that, traditionally their year of founding is given as 1924. But the question I ask here, and I'd love to get feedback because I'm not saying I have a definitive answer here by any stretch, but you know, how 
much of a connection does that club, the 1924 club, have with the club that was formed in 1896-97 that I've been talking about just there. So just to give a little bit of ba background. So as I said, they went to the Leinster Junior League in 1899. Uh, there's, there's progress. There's a lot of uh, kind of minor trophy wins. Uh, Drumcondor are Leinster Junior Shield winners in 1911-1912 season. And by this stage, they've already had players in kind of Leinster Junior selections and things like that. So they have some of the top young players um, in you know, the province. And I say junior league doesn't necessarily mean underage. Junior means kind of level of football. So you're junior and senior leagues and so on. And now minor, which do, does kind of mean kind of the underage and the um, kind of under 18, uh, they do have very successful minor side. And I've just mentioned a couple of them there. Uh, so they had uh, future internationals such as Bert Kerr and Ed Brooks. And if you look actually at the photograph on the uh, right there, uh, they're players from uh, the Irish Olympic squad in 1924. Uh, that photograph is actually taken when the Irish Olympic squad came back and they were playing uh, against the USA uh, national team who had been competing at the 24 Olympics as well in Paris. And uh, Ned Brooks, who didn't make the Olympic squad because he played professionally, uh, was actually called into that game. He scored a hat-trick against the USA. And uh, Bert Kerr was also involved in that game. Now, Bert and Ned both were Bohemians players at that stage, but they, they were internationals. Uh, Bert Kerr had a very interesting uh, future career. He was uh, uh, involved in the in, uh, bloodstock industry and had numerous uh, you know, successful racehorses, including Grand National winners. Um, but they were both uh, young players for uh, Drumcondra. They were minor players from Drumcondra. And, and actually, a number of newspaper reports says that basically Despite the success they had uh, as for the Drum Conner minor team, the club was disbanded uh, around 1914, 1915. And there's a list in a couple of newspaper reports of uh, kind of the key players for um, the different uh, of, of that Drum Conner minor team and where they went afterwards. They went to a lot of other clubs. Now you see there are some of them that are mentioned, Bohemian, Strandville, Shelburne, Shamrock Rovers, and so on. Uh, Kerr and Brooks, uh, some say 10 years after that dissolution of that club, uh, end up a Bohemians, but uh, Nagel, the goalkeeper, becomes very successful, plays for Shamrock Rovers and so on. Um, now, why would the club disband if they're having the success? Well, I suppose a lot of clubs uh, lost uh, members and actually lost pitches as well and then ceased to function uh, effectively because of World War One. So if you think about it, uh, you know, a conservative estimate would put the Dublin area alone uh, of, of basically having 50,000 plus uh, men enlisting to fight the First World War, and the majority of those uh, men enlist in 1914, 1915. Um, and obviously, th that's players, that's administrators, that's supporters, all enlisting uh, from you know what is actually a much smaller city than the city we would know today. The other big issue was that because of uh, wartime rationing, um, any sort of uh, cultivatable, farmable land gets used up. Um, so say there was talk that, you know, uh, that Daily Man Park might, might be used, but Bose successfully managed to keep playing on Daily Man. But a lot of other uh, football pitches uh, aren't as lucky, and not just football pitches, cricket pitches, rugby pitches, and so on, Gaelic pitches, even. Um, you know, they are put under, uh, you know, they're used to grow vegetables and things like that to support the war effort and keep people fed. So perhaps uh, their pitches were no longer available. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, potential reasons why they withdraw from the league and you know basically are disbanded and this isn't uh, unique to Drumcondra this happens across the league so the Leinster Football Association lose uh, dozens and ultimately hundreds of clubs uh, from their membership over the course of the war it does begin to bounce back uh, once uh, towards eight, 1918 and then quite quickly the number of clubs uh, grows again uh, once kind of peace is declared and so on but it is interesting to see you know what happened with that club now it's not fully straightforward because despite the reports of the club folding around 1915 or so there are still refer references to a drum conda side playing uh, albeit um you know not at as high a level but there are you know references to drum, a, a drum conda side as you know up to 1918 and in fact uh, there's a reference to a few players who are and a few people who are very central um to the later drum conda one is tom criven and you see the photographs there of uh, tom criven and thomas johnson uh, that photograph is taken from a newspaper clipping around the uh, 1927 Cup final, which we'll come on to shortly. Uh, by that stage, uh, obviously, as you can see from the photograph, Tom Criven is the chairman of Drumcondra. Now, Tom was uh, kind of one of the standout uh, wingers of his day, 
as a player. Uh, and we're talking about that period from kind of say 1910 to 1920. So, you know, he, he's listed as appearing in these later drums team, and then, and then he's also listed as, you know, making guest appearance for Shelburne and so on. But whatever happens or whatever version of this, of Drum Conduct kind of limps on, uh, by kind of 1924, you see newspaper reports of, of Cribben, Johnson, and uh, kind of three others being credited, sometimes referred to as the Big Five, being credited as refounding or founding again, uh, Drum FC in 1924. So really, that's where we have a kind of a definite start date. We, the, there is a bit of ambiguity about what happens exactly from kind of 1915 onwards. There are versions of Drumcondra, there are clubs called Drumcondra playing at various different levels and leagues. Uh, how much, whether there are offshoots of a few people who you know, left the original club and continued on playing as a Drumcondra. And look, we've seen that, you know, since uh, Drum Conrad withdrew from the league or Amalgamator Home Farm, which we'll come to later in 1972, there's been numerous different teams using the Drum Condra name. So my own um, my own speculation is that at that uh, the Drum Condra team, the, the team that Larry Sheridan was involved with that was founded around 1896-97, uh, continued on until 1914-1915. Thereafter, a Drum Condra withdrew, but that there were other Drum Condras um, playing in around that time. Uh, and the club is then refounded in 1924 by Tom, by Tom Cribben, Thomas Johnson, and others. So, very, very quickly, this Drumcondra team comes to national problems. Um, so, they're a Leinster senior league side, but despite that, um, they actually get a very, very high profile. So, from kind of 1924, really, they're, they're using Talca Park, although at the time it isn't always called Talca Park. Um, it is sometimes called, uh, funny enough, Richmond Park because it's obviously on Richmond Road. Obviously, now we, we call Richmond Park. Uh, the ground where St. Patrick's Galatic play. Um, initially, they're a Leinster senior league side. So again, they're already at, at kind of senior league level when initially they were kind of a junior side in, in the early kind of uh, early part of the 20th century. And, you know, they make some big signings even as a Leinster senior league side. So uh, like say, for example, in 1926, one of their players, Joe Grace, who is a former Bohemians and Belfast Celtic player, is actually called up for the uh, Irish national team for a game against Italy in one of their earliest uh, international matches. So I think he remains today and Emma said before that there are a number of firsts associated with Drum Condra. One big one is that they are the only side to have had a player capped well at Leinster Senior League level. So Joe Grace did win a cap for Ireland against Italy. Uh, they also signed Johnny uh, Murray, who was a star player for uh, Bohemians earlier in the 20s and even before that. So, I mean, a very high profile player to be playing at Leinster Senior League level. Um, so in 1926, and there's a photograph of the 1926 uh, team there, uh, they win the, what we now know as the Intermediate Cup. Uh, although at the time, it wasn't called the Intermediate Cup, it was called the Qualifying Cup. And uh, they beat, <clears throat> excuse me, Cove Ramblers in that uh, Qualifying Cup final. And that Qualifying Cup qualified you for the FA, FAI Cup proper, um, which this is kind of the, the great Cinderella story. The, the, the drums team, and you can see a nice uh, picture of, of the, the players there, uh, the 11 on whom Drumcondra's destiny uh, <laughs> depends. As, as the newspaper said, uh, they, they go on a bit of a cup run and they beat kind of established uh, League of Ireland sides like Jacobs and Bohemians on their way to a final. And they're playing Brideville. Um, you know, Brideville, uh, who again, who were you know, quite a successful uh, side at the time and, you know, had won a, a number of kind of uh, more minor competitions and were also a League of Ireland side then as well. So the, the finals played in Shelburne Park, which is people now know probably as, as the, the dog racing stadium. Uh, which was then at the home to Shelburne, as the name suggests. And it, it goes to a replay. It's a nil-all draw. And then it, on, the, on the replay, Johnny Murray, um, at, in extra time, uh, scores the winner. So it's, it's, it's a final that goes to replay. It's the first final that goes to extra time. Um, and another first, a year later, um, in the FAI Cup semi-final the following year, when drums reached the, reached the final again, were beaten by bows. Uh, the drums Fortson, uh, Fortson's uh, Cup semi-final becomes the first match broadcast on Irish radio. Uh, Fortson's, are, of course, are the team from Cork uh, associated with the Ford factory, um, which is, you know, obviously uh, there was many works teams there. We've seen Jacobs, there's obviously St. James Gage associated with the Guinness Brewery and so on. I'm just going to find the reference here. Uh, we're going to read a small bit of this. So just re in relation to that, uh, uh, that, that um, radio broadcast, so uh, as it says here, this is uh, Sean Ryan's book, the FAI Cup. Uh, Drumcondra featured another piece of history. Their 28 Cup run when their 3-0 semi-final win of Fordson's 
was the first soccer match to be broadcast on Irish radio. And I like this. There was commentary by John Murphy of, of the Pioneers, as in the football team, but also the football team associated with the Pioneer Temperance Movement, and Jim Brennan, who was chairman of the Free State League. So he had the chairman of the league and a, 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 another club member basically doing commentary on the first broadcast uh, live radio uh, match in the state's history. Um, and, you know, of course, then uh, a number of firsts there as well. So uh, the, the original final uh, was a one-all draw. And then uh, Johnny Murray, after extra time, scoring the winner uh, on the 9th of April, 1927. And made, meant that Drumcondra became the first uh, Leinster Senior League side to win the FAI Cup, which again, another first. So a lot of firsts. So this is kind of a, an absolute shock, really, their Leinster Senior League side. And despite winning the Cup, so they've won the Intermediate Cup, they've won the FAI Cup. Uh, the following year, they get to the Cup final again, but they're beaten by Bohemians. They're actually only uh, entered into the league a, fall, a year later. Um, I just thought I'd show that there as well. That is the Cup winning side. You can see the two Cups there, the FAI Cup on the left and uh, the Intermediate or Qualifying Cup on the right. So that's the, uh, the drum side there. Um, just an interesting one as well. The, the fullback in that side was uh, Tommy Moore, who I believe worked in Dal Aaron uh, for many years. Uh, he was a cup winner in 1927, but his son was uh, Butch Moore, another first, because Butch Moore was the first man to represent Ireland at the Eurovision Song Contest. So a little bit of uh, Eurovision football trivia there. Um, <laughs> uh, we could say that Dustin the Turkey is a St. Francis fan, apparently, and of course, Johnny Logan is a big Bowes fan. Um, so eventually, the club do get into the league. So They've, they've won, a, won an FAI Cup, FAI Cup. They get it to a successive final. They're finally admitted to the league for the 28-29 season after Athlone, Athlone Town withdraw. Um, just wor worth noting as well that there wasn't a kind of a promotion and relegation system really in the league at the time. Um, the bottom club in the league would sometimes have to seek re-election uh, or sometimes would withdraw and there wasn't a straight promotion. There was then basically clubs would put themselves forward as a candidate to join the league if they want to join the league. So it was the league changes inside from 8 to 10 to 12 to 14 to 16 teams depending on the era so there is no fixed kind of first and second division there isn't a second division in the league around until 1985 uh, and that first season drum kind of finished a respectable fourth uh, but then uh, by the end of 1929 uh, something else very significant happens drum kind of become a public company so that means they can then borrow money and if you look at the bottom of that newspaper um, mentioned there you can actually see some of the names of the first uh, directors of Drum Ponder Football Club. So they're able to raise uh, 3,000 pounds in capital by selling uh, 6,000 10 shilling, 10 shilling shares. So uh, the Keeley family who are stay from uh, O'Daly Road, so up, actually up the road from the, from the library, uh, the Keeley family stayed very involved in the club, uh, even beyond changes in ownership, which we'll discuss uh, later. But you can see then obviously they've, they've, they've gone public, they can borrow money, they can then invest that money into uh, the team, into uh, the ground as well into Talca Park. So that's uh, just that there, moving on. Uh, this was uh, sent to me by Fergal Ryan uh, on Twitter. Uh, this is his grandfather who bought one of those shares and that's the, his share certificate. So his grandfather, Patrick Smith there, um, that is the share certificate uh, that he bought uh, to become a part owner of Drumcondra Football Club, which is quite nice. Um, so, sorry, I'll go back. Uh, not long after that, um, there is a bit of investment. Uh, the Hunter family come in. So um, Drumcondra are a League of Ireland club by the 1930s. They're kind of a fixture in the league now. They, um, uh, they're, they're doing okay. Uh, they're not maybe pulling up as many trees as you might expect after that amazing shock cup win, but things are improving. So the Hunter family come in. Um, they're basically their background is in uh, building and construction. So they're very well placed to start making improvements to Talca Park, which they do. Uh, the ground, of course, is used for more than just football. It is kind of a multi-purpose uh, stadium and arena and event space, really. It's staging boxing and wrestling matches. Uh, funny enough, probably the record attendance for any sporting event in Talca Park is uh, perhaps not football. It's more likely a wrestling match between uh, Jack, with, featuring Jack Doyle, uh, which apparently got a crowd of 23,000. Now, Jack Doyle is probably more famous actually as a boxer and a singer and the fact that he married... Uh, a movie star and various other things. Um, but Jack Doyle, uh, yeah, probably the record draw on Talk About 23,000. Uh, and look, the, the ground is used for all sorts of reasons. It's hosting amusements, fun fairs, fundraising events. So um, uh, St. Joseph's 
there on Portland Row. Uh, the, the funds to construct uh, St. Joseph's House, uh, part of that was, you know, to fundraising uh, amusements and fun fairs at Tolka Park and things like that in uh, the 1930s and so on. Um, so the hunters are able to develop that ground a little bit, but who were the hunters? These are the, the new kind of owners of the club. Um, so basically the two main people involved were uh, brothers William and Walter Hunter, born in Belfast uh, in 1887 and 1893 respectively, so that's William is the older. Um, large Presbyterian family, uh, Belfast family of eight children. Uh, they both come to Dublin. Uh, William does have a bit of sporting pe pedigree. He, he's a player for all Wesley. He gets a, a Leinster uh, junior uh, rugby appearance. Um, so he, he obviously is a man with an interest in sport, but they're the, 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 the family who are really uh, taking over the running of drums after this original kind of group that found, refounded the club in 1924. Um, and that's just the, the hunters uh, on the 1911 census. You see that the two brothers are listed as steeplejacks, um, which obviously led into their, um, you know, de gradually developed into their own construction business. One interesting one, it's a little aside, but it, it leads into a couple of different directions. Um, William Hunter, obviously as a Belfast man, uh, is involved in a, a campaign in, 19, in the 1940s. So this is during the Second World War. Um, there are tensions in Belfast. Uh, there is a, an RUC officer is shot dead. Uh, this is at a time when there's um, uh, kind of parades going on in, in the summer and basically six men are arrested uh, and, and, and charged with the murder of this RUC man um, and they are sentenced to death. Now only one of the, the six is actually uh, executed. It's uh, uh, Tom Williams is, is the one who is executed. He basically claims that he is the, the head of the IRA group and that, you know, as, as the, the leader, he's the, he basically takes uh, responsibility for the death of the RUC officer, although it's not clear who actually fired the shot. And he is executed, but there is uh, a reprieve committee formed, um, which calls for uh, obviously you know the, the com yeah, commuting of, of those sentences. And there's a not, lot of interesting people involved. So the, they've co they contact the governor of Northern Ireland, uh, James Hamilton, who's the, or the Duke of Abercorn. And one of those people is William Hunter, and he chairs a kind of platform with the likes of James Larkin and Sean McBride, who are all part of this uh, reprieve committee, as they're called. And he he's his calls for leniency, uh, while ultimately the other five are, you know, are spared. Uh, Tom Williams isn't so lucky, but, you know, his, his role as chairman of Drumcondra and the fact that he is, you know, Belfast born is mentioned in those, in those newspaper reports. Just an interesting one on Jim Larkin, as I mentioned. So uh, Larkin is there uh, calling for um, uh, leniency uh, in relation to these men charged uh, in Belfast and awaiting execution. Larkin, uh, when he passes away, um, a number of years afterwards, there's a, a movement to basically build uh, a memorial to James Larkin. Now, people will know the, the famous James Larkin statue on O'Connell Street, his hands lift up the air. This isn't actually for that. It, it, it ends up being used to build a, a kind of a meeting hall. Uh, but uh, there is a football match played in 1952 uh, to raise funds for this memorial for J James Larkin. And uh, drums or drum select, they get a few of the guest players playing that match against Doncaster. And Doncaster were regular visitors uh, to Dublin and had a lot of connections with Drumcondra because um, they'd signed a number of players, you know, uh, Kit Lawler, most notably from uh, Drumcondra, but also there was a big connection with Irish managers. Peter Doherty, the great uh, uh, Irish international, uh, is their player manager. So he comes over and plays in that game as well. Actually, one interesting one, one of the guest players that uh, drums bring in for that Jim Larkin fundraising memorial is uh, Sean Hockey, who is the brother of Charles Hockey, who was also a very useful player and played for Shelburne uh, for most of his career. So just some small uh, political connections there. One other political connection I, I should mention is obviously um, one of Drum Connors' most famous ones is Bertie Ahern. And Bertie was, by all accounts, uh, a great fan of Drum a football club. So much so uh, that apparently he's well known as being a Man United fan, but apparently he has a soft spot for Hull City. And the reason he has a soft spot for Hull City was that uh, it was at Hull City that uh, Morris Swan, the uh, drum counter goalkeeper, uh, you know, had some success in England. So Morris Swan, who made his debut as a 15 year old and saved a penalty on his debut in goal for drum counter, uh, later moved to England, made a, later moved to Brittany, originally moved to, to Cardiff and then went on to play for Hull. And for that reason, that Bertie's childhood hero, Morris Swan, played, moved for Hull. He always kept an interest in, in Hull City, apparently. 
Well, and there's a few articles that which seem to back up that claim as well. So some political connections with Drum Country FC there. Moving along to the 40s, when drums become a real power in the league. Um, Eamon Dunphy is somewhat uh, skating in his uh, Rocky Road uh, autobiography. Uh, obviously, he grew up on Richmond Road, uh, right across the road from, from Talker Park, and, and was a drums fan himself in his youth. And he basically said that you know there was accusations among the fans that the, the hunters didn't put in enough money into the club or they didn't spend money wisely and so on and that you know they didn't uh, deliver the success that was expected um perhaps later on that was fair but certainly you couldn't make that argument in the 40s because they had a very strong side in the 40s um uh, they win two league titles and two fai cups and this is a time when the league is probably at its most competitive so Cork United become a very dominant side in the early part of that uh, decade. And really, they're probably one of the most dominant sides in the history of League of Ireland, perhaps one of the strongest. Um, obviously, the League of Ireland continues during World War II. It's not suspended like football in Britain. Um, and to an extent, the strength of the league is much improved. So uh, a lot of Irish players in Britain decided, well, look, there's a war on, football is suspended. I'm going to come back to Ireland. And what do you do when you come back to Ireland? You're going to play uh, football. So the likes of, say, uh, yeah, Cork United have players like Owen Madden and Bill Hayes, who were, uh, you know, top tier English uh, division, uh, first division players, Irish internationals coming back to play for them. So not surprising really that, that you know, Cork United are so successful, but it's not just them. There's plenty of other Irish players coming back to play for Shelburne or Shamrock Rovers. So funny enough, you could say that um, at, at the end of the war, uh, Shamrock Rovers have Tommy Breen, and I think it was uh, Shelburne have uh, Norman Tapkin playing in goal for them. Uh, and they were Man United's two goalkeepers at the outbreak of the war. So you have United's two uh, first, first and second choice goalkeepers coming back to play in the League of Ireland, which is a, a kind of funny state of affairs, really, and not one that is likely to be um, repeated anytime soon. But anyway, returning to drums, drums were in back-to-back -back titles, and they went two FAI Cups uh, and a no number of other uh, minor trophies. And... Uh, well, some slightly major trophies. So the League of Ireland Shield, which is now kind of forgotten about, which was a significant trophy at the time. And there's lots of other, you know, the Leinster Senior Cup, the Top Four Cup, and so on. Um, again, I, I perhaps somewhat dismissively use the term minor trophies, but uh, Drums and Shamrock Rovers contested a Leinster Senior Cup final with over 20,000 at the game, which shows you, which, you know, 20,000 at, at a Leinster Senior Cup game is kind of unimaginable now, but, you know, that shows the draw. Uh, of the competition and draw of the two teams involved. Um, so as you can see there, uh, th that's actually a, a cover from the uh, Drums Shamrock Rovers uh, match program. The Drums won that uh, FAI Cup 2-1 uh, uh, in 46. Um, that's actually a photograph I took myself. That photo is hanging in Kennedy's on Drum Counter Road, Kennedy's pub. Uh, that is the 1943 uh, Drum Counter team. Uh, one name you can see there on the top left is Leo Ward. I just thought I'd mention him briefly. Uh, Leo Ward, uh, in the kind of interesting uh, uh, situation after the war, um, you know, had played for Manchester City, had come back with the outbreak of war, was playing for Rukandra, and then there was this kind of uh, uh, kind of transfer battle where Man City was still claiming after the war that he was their player, and then they held his registration, and then he was saying, well, he wanted to come back and play in uh, Ireland. So, you know, we had a situation where a player was fighting Man City to get at a contract with them so he could play in the League of Ireland for drums. Uh, Leo Ward also had a you know, very successful career as well. Uh, he owned a, owned a change of cinemas in 1983. He was the man who bought uh, the Savoy Cinema. Um, and I think the, the Ward Anderson group uh, owned, a, owned and probably still own a number of cinemas around Dublin. So uh, an interesting individual. And, you know, there's so many different individual stories I could tell, but probably don't have the time to tell them in. Uh, again, that's a uh, Drum Condor picture uh, from that era. I think that's the team that lost to uh, Shamrock Rovers in a subsequent uh, FAI Cup final later in the 1940s. And some very famous names there uh, to anyone who, sorry, <laughs> going back, uh, anyone who, who would, know, would know drums. Um, then moving on, uh, <laughs> my little quote from 1984 by John Gerwell, if there's hope, it must be in, lie in the proles. Uh, the proles family, um, took over the club in 1953. Uh, so Samuel Robert Pohl, or Sam Pohl, or Bob Pohl, as he's uh, <laughs> uh, differently known, uh, took, took over, as I say, in the 53-40 season. Uh, 
he was involved uh, as he joined as director by his sons Robert and Royden. Uh, both were involved with the team. So Royden was very involved with the day to day running the team. He also uh, did apparently play a little bit for the the drum second team, which competed in the Leinster Senior League. Uh, Robert Prohl actually did play uh, first team football uh, for Drum Condor. I think he was a centre half uh, for the team. So he did play uh, first team football. Uh, Sam was a Dubliner, but uh, he was the son of a railway porter and spent much of his time in his youth and growing up in his young adulthood in both Cavan and Dundalk. And it's probably most, uh, he's most probably closely associated with Dundalk. Uh, he played for the Dundalk Great Northern Railway side uh, before injuring, uh, had a career ending injury in the game against Bohemians in his early 20s. But he stayed involved with the Great Northern Railway and with Dundalk FC. Um, and in terms of an administrator, was hugely successful with, with uh, Dundalk. He's credited with uh, keeping the club afloat when they were facing numerous financial challenges and was well known for helping to spot, bring through and then sell for significant uh, transfer fees. A lot of good young players. So Dundalk had a reputation as a selling club, but those transfer fees probably kept the club afloat and during difficult times. And he was very important in terms of an administrator in both the, the, the League of Ireland and in the FAI itself. So Sam takes over the club. Uh, he, he is a man, you know, he's a, he's a wealthy man, but not wealthy by, say, a Brambish Sanders. He's, he's made his, his, his money with, with the railways and things like that. Um, but he is he's a good organiser and he basically sets about modernising uh, Drumcondra and modernising Talca Park as well. So what, uh, what, what do we mean when we say modernising? Uh, first floodlit football match uh, and the first permanently installed set of floodlights were held in Talca Park in 1953, uh, a game against St. Mirren. Um, you know, the, Sc the Scottish side, I think I won the cup uh, previously. Uh, you know, again, it's huge, huge attendance. Uh, he brings in other things. He brings in uh, uh, pitch side hoardings and advertising hoardings, which becomes a, a, you know, a new way to make revenue. Uh, the halftime bovril was <laughs> apparently uh, an idea of his that, you know, he realized that people couldn't get halftime refreshment. It's something he had seen uh, in other grounds in Britain and things like that. He, he introduced that. Um, so you have that first floodlit match in 1953. Uh, and that, you got to remember, the Talk Park has floodlights before Wembley Stadium did, uh, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. And also, that, that free, frees up, uh, creates huge opportunities for us for Talk Park, because prior to that, you did have situations where matches were being played uh, in the winter with fading light, where there's no uh, halftime break, or you're, you're playing half an hour aside and things like that. It also means that uh, Talk Park, uh, with these gradual improvements, becomes more of a focus for things like um, Cup semi-finals and so on. Um, unfortunately, a year after taking over, uh, there's uh, heavy flooding in the Drum County area. And as you can see in the picture on the left-hand side, um, Talk Park is, was completely flooded. Uh, by all accounts, li literally the day after the flooding, uh, Sam and Royden were out on the pitch, uh, building and rebuilding and, you know, breaking down walls to create drainage and stuff like that. And very quickly, they had the pitch back and the stadium back uh, in working order and so on. And there's further investment uh, in uh, Talk Park after that. Also, literally in the first year that the Pro family become involved, um, uh, Drum Condor win the FAI Cup yet again. So they've had the victory in 27. They've had two victories in the Cup in the 40s. And then they have uh, a victory in 53-54 when uh, the Pro family take over. It's a 1-0 win over St. Pat's. Uh, a Desi Byrne uh, OG um, <laughs> by St. Pat's. And uh, it's a very interesting one, a, a, a unique uh, record for Billy Behan. Billy Behan, uh, the famous Manchester United scout, uh, the man who discovered, uh, you know, the likes of Liam Whelan and Paul McGrath, amongst others. Uh, Johnny Carey even as well, apparently. Uh, he creates a new unique record. He's a manager of uh, drums, a short-lived manager with, with drums. He does apparently fall out with um, the Pro family not long after that. But Billy Bean is a manager. He won, he's won the cup. In 43, in the final that Drum Condor won, he was a referee. And he also com competed in two uh, FAI Cup finals in the 1930s as a goalkeeper for Shamrock Rovers. So I don't think anyone has been a goalkeeper, referee, and manager uh, in cup finals across three different decades. But uh, Billy Bean, a man of many talents. Um, so I just, I couldn't resist throwing in that little reference to, to be in there. Um, I was lucky enough to be given um, 
some uh, literature related and some documents related from Condra from a number of sources. Special thank you to, to Ken McHugh, who helped me with a, quite a few bits and pieces. So one of the things I do, I do have in my possession is a set of the 1955 from Condra accounts. It's a very interesting year because, again, it's not long after the Prowl family take over. Um, it is the year after that terrible flooding that I, I, I mentioned. And uh, you can see the directors report there, the list of the directors. So Sam Prowl, Rob Prowl, um, Royden Prowl, uh, uh, Dennis Healy is the secretary there, a member of the Healy family we mentioned earlier. Um, and you can see that, you know, there, they mentioned there the flood damage caused um, uh, to, to the ground that, that there's uh, a lot of the costs and repairs aren't in these accounts. They make the point that only they've only uh, uh, listed a certain amount of, of the accounts, uh, a claim of uh, 1,500 pounds uh, was, was, was filed with the authorities concerned. Um, and then there's an interesting one there, as you can see at the very bottom, uh, a notable addition to the assets of the club is the house and garden at the Ballybock end of the ground of Talk Park, which were purchased during the year. It is hoped that by this addition, to eventually increase the accommodation of Talk Park from 15,000 to 22,000 people. So this, is, so this is again the uh, the Ballybock end of the ground. So this is, shows the ambition of the club. This the the, the Pearl family have only taken over in 1953, and then already by May 1955, they're they're buying property adjacent to the ground. They're planning to get the capacity up over 20,000. Um, this is just a breakdown. If you ever wondered how much it costs to run an, an Irish football club in 1955, well, you can see here, and you can see quite clearly what the costs were and things like that. So again, in wages there, top left, you can see. The players uh, were being paid uh, 2,706 pounds, 12 shillings uh, a year. So we can assume that's a squad of probably uh, a first team squad, of probably maybe 15, 16 players, probably not a, as big a first team squad as you would have nowadays. You can see some of the other uh, big expenses. You can see there's 1,819 pounds uh, in terms of maintenance and repairs, probably a lot of that in relation to some of the flood damage. And you can see the other costs there. You can see the gate receipts as well. So with the home, what they're making from home matches, £5,708.15 shillings sixpence from home games. There's obviously a bit of money from away games and so on. Uh, and from exhibition matches, ground hire. I should say exhibition matches were, were a big deal for, for the clubs at the time. You've got to remember this is an era uh, when there's no live TV football. So if you want to see the best players, uh, how do you see them? Uh, you want to see them live. So if you want to see Stanley Matthews, uh, maybe he's, playing uh, for uh, Blackpool against Drumcondra, or maybe he's playing for Drumcondra. So say someone like Matthews, uh, a very shrewd operator who, you know, made money where he could at a time when the, there was a maximum wage uh, in British football. Um, the maximum wage was finally abolished in the early 1960s when it was at around £20. But immediately after the, the Second World War, the maximum wage in Britain was about £9. So you had this crazy situation where Irish clubs could actually outbid uh, and outpay uh, English first division clubs for players uh, and because there was kind of uh, something called the open door policy where uh, British teams kind of signed Irish players without recognizing transfer fees so they just signed them and said here come play for us and you know players went Irish teams started doing the same so you had a situation where Jock Dodds a Scottish international who was a first division striker uh, for Blackpool was was being signed at probably twice the wage, wage he was earning in the English first division by Shamrock Rovers so you had crazy situations like that so just in relation to exhibition games, they were a big money spinner because you could bring over the cream of uh, sporting talent and have them play uh, in Dublin. And it wasn't just English clubs as well. You could often bring over, uh, bring over clubs from uh, Central Europe, uh, you know, anywhere from the you know, Czechoslovakia, Germany, uh, England, Scotland, uh, France, Holland, everywhere. Um, or you could get, you know, guest selection teams. So you could get a a drum Condra 11, which might feature team players from all around the league against a big English side, whether it be Man United or Arsenal or so on. So you can see basically there uh, the revenue from the club. So the club make a very small uh, net profit, £253. Well, not too small by, by the standards of the time. So the club is in profit that year, 1955, uh, financial year ending May 31st. So I hope you've had a chance to kind of look at there some of the costs, things like that. One, one that was interesting was uh, fuel and light, you can see £197. Uh, as I mentioned, they're the first club to have permanent floodlights, uh, but also there was many stories. I think Alf Gervin told us after the um, the Ray Kill talk that we, we had last year about how uh, tight, I suppose, the Pro family were with use of uh, the floodlights and that, you know, switching on the lights at the very last minute for when players were training and talking and things like that. So uh, 
probably, probably that's why fuel and light, 197 pounds, it was, it was an ongoing cost. Um, moving into the 50s, which is again a further decade of success for drums, there's another FAI Cup trying for 1956-57 season, uh, defeating Shamrock Rovers in the FAI Cup in, in front of a crowd of 30,000. Uh, there's league titles in 57-58, and then at the beginning of the next decade, 60-61, uh, the club are rarely outside the top three. They're battling out with, and the 50s is a very uh, competitive decade. People kind of think there was this drums rovers rivalry where they won everything. They were probably two of the strongest teams, but they didn't win everything. They, you know, Shells won won a title around then. Uh, St. Pat's won a couple of titles around then as well. But really, the two glamour teams, the two big draws, are Shamrock Rovers and Drumcondra around this era. And I'll talk about that shortly. And again, big crowds in both Talca and Milltown. There are significant changes as that team develops, though. So. A lot of the stalwarts of the late 40s and through into the 50s begin to move on. So the likes of, of Benny Henderson, sometimes called Rosie Henderson. The uh, story I read is that he was called Rosie because he sang a song called Rosie O'Grady at a bit of a knees up after an FAI Cup, Cup success uh, back in a house on Holly Park uh, Road. And he was then christened Rosie uh, as part of that. Uh, drums also did have another um, goalkeeper called Eamon Darcy on stage who was uh, nicknamed Sheila. If anyone knows why Eamon Darcy was called Sheila, I'd love to know. And please do throw that into the Q&A box. Uh, I'd love to hear that. But as you can see there, Benny Henderson, who, you know, star uh, winger comes centre forward. Uh, uh, one of the famous Henderson family has produced so many goalkeepers. He left, as did Shane Noonan, Johnny Robinson, Paddy Neville, all join uh, Dundalk. Uh, there is change. Kit Lawler comes back from England, who's, you know, kind of a star. And, and Dunphy talks about, you know, Lawler as his hero. Actually, I might just read a small excerpt from, uh, from uh, Dunphy's uh, autobiography here. Um, obviously, he's, he grew up literally across from Talca Park. Um, as he said here, Sam, Sam Pro bought from Condor Football Club in the early 50s from the Hunter family. League of Ireland football was entering its golden age. Grounds were packed with fans eager to watch their local heroes, which is as close they would ever get to the great stars of England, whose deeds they could only read about or glimpse on Pathé newsreels. The standard of the play in League of Ireland was high. Drums is my team. They were the only League of Ireland club on the north side, apart from the amateurs of Bohemians. So <laughs> I, take, I take this point anyway. Uh, but again, Dunphy does talk about um, some of the players he loved as well. I'll throw it in there. So uh, Lawler, as in Kit Lawler, was the leader of the team, an elegant master of the football. He set the tempo and directed it uh, every game. To the skills he learned on East Wall Streets he'd grown up on, Kit added poise, guile and vision uh, to see a telling pass and make a vital goal. The wit and imagination of his football were matched by his post-game persona. He was a character. He was good and he knew it. Kid liked to drink. He was said to be his own man and cared little for the bosses. There were other marvellous players on that team. Desi Glynn, a splendidly versatile centre-forward, a scorer and maker of goals from a better-off drum counter family. He had no interest in turning pro or going to England. He had a good job in the civil service and wore a suit on match days. And he, he goes on and talks about many other players, Rosie Henderson, Bunny Fulham, someone Bunny I'll come to shortly, uh, a striking character in the team. He'd been a star in the league for, for Shelburne and for Bowes, I should answer before that. Uh, he had offers to play in England, but turned them down because of the money. About £14 a week wasn't good enough. Bunny was a bricklayer, building site, ar ar building site ar aristocracy. Sorry, For a while, he, he boosted his income by playing part-time for Hollyhead Town, a boat trip across the Irish Sea in Wales on a Friday night, back on a Saturday with tax-free sterling. Uh, Hollyhead being a popular destination for Irish players at the time. Um, and you know, we'll come to Bunny shortly. Uh, you also had the emergence of a, a, a few young stars in the team. Alan Kelly Sr., uh, Irish international goalkeeper, for at one stage the record appearance holder for the Irish national team. John Sonny O'Neill, both of whom would later leave uh, uh, Drumcondra and go uh, play for Preston North End in England. Uh, Alan Kelly Sr., especially. Uh, achieving great success. He has a stand named after him there at Deepdale and Preston. Um, but to, just talking a little bit about that Rovers rivalry, I've used that picture of, of Liam Toohey there. Uh, Liam and Bunny Fulham apparently had a quite a tasty rivalry. Um, and, you know, this is the 1950s. This is, you know, sliding tackles and tackles from behind and all sorts of those. It was perfectly legal at the time. I, I heard a nice story from a couple of different people that um, when uh, Bunny was ill later in life, uh, he met Liam uh, for a point. I was told in, in, in uh, the homestead in Cabra, uh, was, I believe Bunny was a Cabra man, and that uh, Liam was being brought in to meet uh, Bunny for kind of a, a point for, you know, old friend's sake, old time's sake. And Liam asked whether he needed shin pads going into uh, the homestead. Uh, such was their, their friendly competitive rivalry. Um, 
Drumcondra faced Rovers in 12 different cup finals uh, around that era. Um, so you can see how competitive they were. Uh, the Leinster Senior Cup final clash in 1956 that I remember grew, uh, mentioned previously uh, drew a crowd of over 20,000 to a Leinster Senior Cup final. Just think about that. Um, and Drumcondra versus Rovers became the league's first ever all ticket game the next season. Uh, that game was later abandoned with the score of 2-1. Um, basically, Rovers fans invaded the pitch and there was some um, altercations with Royden Prowl as well. Basically, there was a, a bit of a mini riot because uh, Sergeant Tom Cannon, uh, his father, Harry Cannon, had been an Irish international and a goalkeeper for Bohemians, uh, basically gave a... Uh, there was a goal mouth scramble. He gave an unclear decision and pa basically pandemonium broke, broke, broke out because these, these were team they were basically first and second in the league they were fighting it out for the league title uh, drums would eventually uh, win the league that year but that was the, the level of the rivalry and you know you're getting well into five figures for pretty much all their games and if you just look across there that's a, a gaming as the english league which was played in leeds and you can look at the the league of ireland select so the league of ireland representative games were hugely popular at the time they're basically just a tier below it full international appearances but you look at the team there's four or five drums players there's four or five uh, Rovers players and um, uh, Donald Leahy of Evergreen, you know, is, sneaks in there as as does um, I think it's it's, it's uh, Jimmy Dunn Jr. of uh, or sorry Tommy Dunn of uh, St Pat's as well. But you can see the dominance of Rovers and um, Drums in, in in those eleven. So and I could pick any number of matches. The Drums uh, contingent was always very high, as was the Rovers one. So there's that huge rivalry between the two clubs, and that kind of comes to dominate. Uh, the popular imagination, the north-south rivalry in Dublin. It is, at that period, certainly the Dublin Derby. You would say now the Dublin Derby is, is Bowes Rovers. In the early part of the 20th century, it was Bowes Shells, but really drums and rovers in the 40s and 50s comes the, the, the Dublin Derby. Um, and of course, this success in the 1950s means there's the added bonus of Europe. So previously, you're, you're, you're getting in... Um, what would you say, getting in teams to play exhibition matches. But now you have competitive games against European opposition. So that league win means that uh, drums enter the European Cup. Now they get to play Atletico Madrid. Um, you know, the Atletico Madrid, who have, you know, Vava, the Brazilian centre forward, who's been part of uh, the World Cup winning side in 1958, is their centre forward. Enrique Collar, the, the uh, Spanish international, uh, Bunny Fulham said the fastest player he ever marked are in that team. Now it's, it's a heavy defeat. Um, but Bunny becomes the first drums player to score in Europe in a 5-1 home defeat in Dalyman Park. Um, Dalyman, obviously, a bigger venue at the time, so it could hold more fans. Um, and they, they lose heavily over in Spain. So I think it was a 13-1 defeat. Uh, the next league title win, with obviously, uh, drums win the league in 60-61. They get to play FC Nuremberg, who are the German champions. Um, Max Morlock, the German World Cup winner in 54, features them. There's another heavy defeat. But the results do improve in Europe. So I love that photograph there. That's um, from the early 1960s. There you can see the players uh, waving as they board the plane, the Aer Lingus jet, uh, to play one of their European adventures. Um, uh, drums become the first side to enter the Intercity Fairs Cup, which is kind of later succeeded by the UEFA Cup and now the Europa League. The Fairs Cup is kind of an interesting one. It initially wasn't run by UEFA. It was uh, a way for cities that held international fairs to add a footballing dimension to it. Uh, and some clubs didn't actually pick a club. Sometimes they picked a selection of clubs, uh, a selection of players. Uh, so there was a London 11 competed in the early, um, early competitions of the Ferris Cup. So you had players from Chelsea, Millwall, Spurs, Arsenal, all Charlton all playing together as the London 11. Uh, drums are the first side to enter the Intercity Ferris Cup. And they're also the first side to win, a first Irish side to win a two-legged tie in Europe. They beat a, a Danish side called Unza, or Odense, as some people, but I've been reliably told that the Danish pronounce it Unza. And they were also one of those selection teams. They had players picked from four clubs in the city, but Drums beat them 6-5 uh, on aggregate, and they progressed to the next round. And who do they get in the next round? Just a little team from Germany called Bayern Munich. Um, now, Bayern knock out uh, Drums in that second round, uh, but Drums do actually win a home game uh, it, it, against Bayern Munich. Billy Dixon scores the goal uh, from a Reiko cross, um, to give them a 1-0 win in Dublin. However, they, they lose quite heavily in Germany uh, in quite a controversial game. The game goes ahead pretty much on a frozen pitch. And even to this day, it's still controversial among drums fans and players whether that game should have gone ahead. And if it had 
uh, maybe even delayed or, or played somewhere else or you know something like that on a better pitch that wasn't frozen, maybe the result might have been different. Who knows? Um, it's, an, it's an interesting counterfactual. Um, into the 60s, I suppose the, the decade begins well with that league title win. Uh, and uh, drums are going to going for uh, the double, really. Um, you know, they're they're actually very confident that they're going to win the double in 60 61. Uh, they have had a great season. Dan McCaffrey, uh, from from I believe from Oma Town, uh, scored 50 goals in all competitions that season. Uh, he's had a great, great season. He's been signed by Sligo Rovers. Uh, there's a narrow defeat to St. Pat's, uh, in the cup final, so they don't do a historic double. Uh, revenge for Jimmy Collins, the Pats manager, uh, who was, uh, you know. Jimmy was a, a good goalkeeper in his, in his day. He played for for Bows, for Rovers, and for Pats. Uh, he's the Pat manager, but he was on the losing side uh, <laughs> uh, as a goalkeeper in 1954. So he got his revenge over Drum Condra as manager there in 1961. And for many years, that was Pat's last uh, cup win uh, until uh, their more recent uh, victory with uh, thanks to, to Christy Fagan a few years back. Um, that's actually just uh, that that that. The nice photograph as well, which I featured at the start there, which I it seems mentioned some of those players and shows some of them there uh, that I've mentioned before. Ray Kyo there, who I mentioned. Ray was for a long time. I thought he was the first uh, black player in the, in the League of Ireland. Um, there were one or two players who possibly played League of Ireland before him, uh, a guy called Francis Archibong in the late forties playing for Bohemians, but he was certainly the first prominent black player in the League of Ireland, uh, and some you know, very uh, well known players there. Uh, you know, drums legends like Jimmy Marcy, Bunny Fulham, Alf Gervin, Tommy Kinsel, and so on. Um, but that that side, despite that that initial success in, in, in the early 60s, that, that side begins to break up. So Tommy Rowe, Stan Panel, Billy Kennedy all move on in 1962. Um, drums do win the league again in 64, 65, beating Rovers by a point. That that bows, or sorry, that drums rovers rivalry still uh, continuing. Uh, and in, in Europe the following season, uh, Jimmy Marcy uh, uh, scores a goal which gets a, a 1 0 home win over Vorwarts Berlin, who are the East German uh, champions. Vorwarts Berlin are the army team based in Berlin. They're late, later moved by the East German government to Frankfurt am Oder. Um, but uh, unfortunately, they've, they've lost the tie 3 1 on aggregate. So there is, there is a, a high point in that win, but they lose the tie overall. But then as the 60 progress, I suppose the club's uh, fortunes decline. After that league title win, they'd never finish higher than seventh place again. And by the early 70s, despite the return of some veteran stars like Jimmy Marcy, Morris Swan, the goalkeeper, uh, the club continued to struggle. So by the end of the decade, uh, they're finishing 14th, 14th and 12th in a 14-team league. So they're, as I said, they're still they're finishing bottom two of those seasons um, and are basically, you know, not relegated because there's nowhere to them to be relegated to. Uh, the club are reportedly uh, 6,000 in debt and... Uh, to the shock of many, the Pro family sell the club to Home Farm in May 1972. So this is a very strange sort of takeover whereby uh, a junior club, Home Farm, who've been trying to get into the league for many years, who've been rejected on numerous occasions. And Sam Pro actually, when he's, he's um, asked about this, basically said he had always supported uh, the admittance of Home Farm into the League of Ireland as a, you know, uh, obviously they're famous as a, as a junior club, as a nursery for young players. But... Um, you know, it's, it's never agreed by the league and the FAI. So Home Farm see it as the only way they can get a side into the League of Ireland is by basically uh, taking over an existing League of Ireland club. And because of the struggles that Drumcondra are facing, they buy out Drumcondra. Now, this is supposed to be a hybrid Home Farm Drumcondra branded side, and they're going to continue playing at Talk Park. But uh, pretty much after that 72-73 season, the Drumcondra part is dropped off and Home Farm basically stay on as... Uh, a League of Ireland side and the name and the imagery of, of Drumcondra kind of disappears from the league from 1972 onwards. I'll just read a little bit there uh, from one of the newspaper reports. Um, uh, as you see there, reactions from the Pro family. Robert and Royden agreed, we have had enough. It is too much for a family to run a club like this in the 70s. Still, we're going to miss it. Their father, Sam or Bob, as he's alternately known, was not even present at the official announcement at the end of, for the end of his era. Uh, for he was away... Uh, for he was travelling home from Coleraine after the Blacks in a cup final. That was kind of a north-south um, cup final uh, between teams in Northern Ireland and, and uh, the League of Ireland. Uh, but he told me, I've been over 50 years in football and it's been a good life. My interest in the game won't, won't wane now. 
Uh, and, he, and you can see there he adds that bringing fresh life to the league uh, you know, and supporting the idea of home farm joining. Uh, around that time, literally that same week, uh, Sam Pro um, uh, steps down from his roles within the FAI, the League of Ireland as well. Uh, or a little before that, he, he has been away uh, at an Ireland match uh, in Switzerland, I believe, and has had a kind of minor health scare there and things like that. So I suppose maybe it, it, it's for his age and you know, waning health uh, is perhaps why he, he's leaving as well, as well as the, the financial drain and resources uh, keeping uh, the club going, uh, despite all the success. So Home Farm at the time basically are, are strictly amateur as well. Um, as you see at the top of that article as well, there are several uh, players who are paid still on the books of um, of uh, Home Farm. You see Jer the likes of Jerry Garvin, Brendan Place, others, Pete Mahan, who are all quite, you know, quite prominent individuals, but Home Farm are saying that they're going to stay strictly as an amateur side, but they want somewhere for their young players to progress through to League of Ireland level. So basically, that is effectively kind of the end of Drum Condor. Well, not quite the end, because of course, um, despite Home Farm dropping the Home Farm Drum Condor, suffix there are numerous other drumcondra sides that emerge in the years afterwards drumcondra athletic uh, drumcondra fc and so on uh, there's seven sub subsequent amalgamations of those clubs and this was the two most prominent really are drumcondra fc who are playing the leinster senior league now and uh, give a shout out to eddie grace who was a great help uh in preparing um this presentation and of course there's drumcondra afc as well who have teams in the uh, drum district schoolboy league and the north uh, north dublin schoolboy league as well and both teams are still playing in the famous uh, blue and gold, not blue and yellow, blue and gold, I've always been told. And you can see just the, the, the crests used there are, are still using and referencing the original crests of the, the, the famous League of Ireland side. Um, that's really it from me. Uh, I would love to hear more from you as well. And if you want to get in touch, I've left my email up on the screen there. I've also listed the, the, the blog post, uh, uh, the blog link there as well. There's a lot of stuff on Irish football there, plenty of stuff on drums. Uh, national team bows and various other bits and pieces uh, but I'd love to hear from you your own thoughts or recollections happy to answer questions as well and finally again just a big thank you to everyone in the festival history everyone in Dumb City Council Libraries uh, and everyone else who's been such a great uh, assistance in preparing um, this talk. Uh, thanks a million, Jerry. So there was a couple of uh, questions put into the, the question and answer box there. So I'm going to read them out for you to answer and um, hopefully you can do some of them justice. So I'm just going to go to some of the ones that I answered while you were talking, but just to because there was some interesting comments, you know. Um, so the first person was asking, Helena was asking, will the recording be available on Dublin Festival History? website it will be after uh the festival concludes so the festival actually concludes this weekend this weekend is the what's known as the big weekend um so that's saturday and sunday so do take a look at the dublin festival of history website and on their social media accounts so i put dublin festival of history into google and you'll see what else is on offer there and um, so steve was saying a drum conda club was in athletic union league for the 1917 to 18 season playing out of the thatch. They disbanded in December 1917, according to a newspaper report at the time, uh, fell to pieces for no apparent cause. That's an interesting one now because the thatch, which is up kind of, um, people know kind of around Yellow Road and Whitehall, uh, that's, there was the thatch pub there and there was fields. And a lot of different clubs used the thatch, uh, a lot of early League of Ireland clubs. So I was wondering myself um, if there, if maybe they were people who were part of the original Drum Condor Club that kind of went by the wayside in the early 1914, 1915, and then continued on there in the AUL because they had been kind of uh, Leicester Junior and Leicester Senior. Um, so that, that's an interesting one now. Um, thanks for that. Uh, that's really interesting. That's another point of research for me. <laughs> so then Ken uh, just mentions here that some of the drums players actually worked for Hunter on the renovation of the four courts, including Ken's uncle, Fran O'Brien Senior. Oh, and a big thank you to Ken. Ken was, has been a great help uh, in compiling some of this material. He gave me loads of uh, drums related stuff there. That's fascinating to learn that uh, I'd heard that some of them, uh, some of the players basically got kind of jobs with the Hunter kind of construction company, but I didn't know they'd actually worked on the four courts as well. That's really interesting. Uh, Peter says it's lovely to see a picture including Liam McConkey, his granddad, a man who won a junior hurling championship with Vinnie's in 1942. I was subsequently booted out of the GAA for playing soccer. And he wouldn't be the only one. Um, there's actually quite a few uh, very prominent uh, drums players 
who um, were also very good um, uh, Gaelic Games players. There was, I can't remember exactly, there was a very prominent player who was uh, a, a great hurler and basically was kind of part of one of their successful teams and then left, I think it might have been the 40s or 50s. So that's, that's something I have to look back in as well. But there's, there's actually quite a bit of crossover with uh, Gaelic, football or, uh, Gaelic footballers or hurlers who also kind of uh, played a bit of football. Um, Morris, you mentioned, uh, thanks, Jerry, and she's saying it's been really informative. Great to see all the photographs. Um, and Anne is the daughter of Jimmy Morrissey. Um, my dad, as I mentioned, there played briefly with drums, mostly for the Leinster Senior League side in the early 60s, but he played a little bit with Jimmy. And I've heard this said by a few other people, including by Ray Kyo. He said, Jimmy, for not being the biggest guy in the world, was the best header of the ball he ever saw in his life. And a few people who had seen Jimmy Player played with him, kind of said the same thing. Uh, so look, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, they enjoyed the talk. And uh, I heard a lot about the likes of Jimmy Morrissey and uh, Ray Keown, who's grown up from me, hopefully. Um, Manuel says his last memory of drums had Ambi Fogart as manager. Yeah, Ambi um, was um, smashing player Irish international. He began his career at Bohemians and then uh, went over to England and played for uh, Sunderland and quite a few other teams. Um, Came back, I think he was, uh, came back, was player manager down in Cork as well. So, yeah, Am Ambi was kind of one of those guys who had like a 20 year long career and played for a whole host of other clubs and I think managed in some very interesting places as well. Sean says, thanks for the evening. I have about 20 plus drums match programs from the 50s. Is there an archive anywhere that I could scan and upload them to for people to see? I also have an original blue and yellow scarf. <laughs> Well, I wonder, would um, the sports archive in, in Pier Street be interested in that? I'd say that would be the, the place to try. All right, Sean. So um, if you wanted to even email myself at drumcondralibrary at dublincity.ie, that's drumcondralibrary at dublincity.ie, I can pass you on the info. Um, Rohini Library. Oh, I wonder who is that in Rohini Library. How long did Home Farm stay in League of Ireland? Uh, well, like Home Farm was still going... Um, they kind of had a number of amalgamations. Funny that they were their home farm, Drumcondra, for a while. But then uh, I remember them in the 1990s as a home farm, Everton, because they had a partnership with Everton uh, Football Club in, in Liverpool, obviously. And they were home farm Leeds for a bit as well. So they were uh, in the league run well into the 21st century. Um, they, and uh, in fairness, as home farm, they did win uh, an FAI Cup, even as a fully amateur side, uh, under the management of uh, Dave Bacuzzi, who um, began his career at Arsenal and then en somehow ended up... Uh, as a player manager down in Cork and then later became manager of Home Farm. So they did have some success, uh, although most of the time uh, after the first division was introduced in 1985, they were most of the time a first division side. So uh, I can't remember the exact year where they left the League of Ireland. Obviously, they're still there up on, on in, in Whitehall. Uh, they're still producing lots of good young players. They're still a great club with a great history. The, the greatest nursery uh, in the world, as Matt Busby once described them, um, but uh, I can't remember the exact year they withdrew from League of Ireland, but it's definitely uh, into this, well into this uh, century anyway. Mark is wondering what happened to the professional players after Home Farm took over? Um, I, I meant to look into that a little bit more. A lot, as I said, quite a few of them were kind of quite well known, like Jerry Garvey, uh, Jerry Garvin, sorry, uh, who was, uh, I think, a nephew of, of uh, Con Martin and people like that. Uh, Pete Mahan, who people would know was, you know, uh, League of Ireland manager up until recently. Brendan Place, who had a, a great career. Um, they did all end up at, at different clubs, but I'm not sure exactly what happened, whether there was kind of an agreed payoff, because obviously Home Farm would have then assumed those kind of, those, those contracts, those kind of, leg, that kind of legacy of, of drums. So I'm not sure what happened. To them. Most of them did continue on with League of Ireland careers, but I'm not sure if they were uh, transferred out or bought out of their contracts or if there's an agreement reached for Home Farm. I'll have to look into that a bit more. Tony is wondering if John Giles' father was drums manager at one time. He was, Dickie Giles, and he won a, a cup with them. Um, there's a great story where he borrowed um, a player from his his brother, Matt Giles, um, uh, for the uh, cup final. I will find it. If John will give me a moment there, uh, I will find the reference for him uh but, 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 but i had it jotted down here sorry um uh, 
and I will in a minute. Um, <laughs> sorry, if you want to take the other question, Emma, sorry, and I'll um, sure. I'll find yeah. that. <laughs> right. Uh, so the next question is from Keen. Um, so Keen is just saying, thanks, Jerry. Great talk. Fantastic piece of trivia on Billy Bean. Have you come across much about the Rosie Henderson distillery transfer debacle? <laughs> I did, yes. Um, I was going to try and include that. It, the, drums had a habit of getting themselves sued by various people. Um, and they, they brought over a couple of um, coaches from England and they got sued by them. They're, yeah, the, if I remember correctly now, as I was researching for this piece, uh, Ro Benny Rosie uh, was basically approached um, and told that he basically distillery wanted him on loan. So distillery at the time were based in, in Belfast in Grosvenor Park and they wanted him on loan for a bit and would he go up? Now he agreed he would. Uh, and then when he got up, when he was going up there to play the match for distillery uh, on the basis of it'd be a very short term thing, he basically told, found out he had been sold and he said, well, I never agreed to be sold. I only ever agreed to go on loan. And he basically did have to bring the case to court and they had to then, there was a whole back and forth about what was agreed, how long he was supposed to be there for, whether he had agreed to it or not. And you got to remember, this is not really, this is pre-Bosman era. There was very little player power there. The, the club owned your registration. So even if your contract was out, you couldn't sign for another club without their permission. So he, Rosie was kind of in uh, an invidious position, uh, but he actually won his case um, probably because in the research uh, drums kind of had an unfortunate way of maybe not always treating players and coaches as they should and then it coming back to bite them in various different court cases and things like that so um yeah so sharon says thank you jerry we really enjoyed your drums presentation from sharon helen morrissey wife and daughter of jimmy morrissey keep up the good work what a great team joe similarly says thanks my dad was Paddy Neville from Port Moran. Um, and David says, thanks, Jerry. Very interesting and informative as always. Hopefully, Tolka Park, the ground where all these great games took place, can be saved. Uh, Tommy says, my dad, Frank Hegarty, played for several clubs, presented DDSL many times, Evergreen and Bowes B team. Just on the, the previous question, I found that uh, reference of uh, to the Giles. So um, as someone said, yeah, Dickie Giles, um ha, ha, had been manager of drums as well um but uh this is a reference to Matt Giles actually uh Matt Giles who was manager of transport who won the FAI Cup in 1950 who were basically the, the team of CIE um so basically Joe Barnwell who'd been playing for the James Gate Reserves uh when Matt Giles took him to uh, distillery not the distillery up north there was a team basically called distillery again for around um from Randall Condor, they were based with the, the DWD the distillery, basically more kind of off to our set street. Uh, and he won an intermediate cup with them before uh, he was recommended to drums, um, basically uh, as part of that team that won uh, the FAI Cup in 1946 uh, with the likes of Rosie Henderson and Tommy McCormick and uh, Robin Lawler and all those. So yeah, there was a, a few uh, reasons to be uh, for uh, interconnection with the Giles family. So Dickie was a manager. Uh, Matt Giles got helped get them some players for the cup final, and um, uh, I think Christy Giles played for them as well. Uh, so there's big connections with, with, with the Giles family there. One of my favorite ones is uh, they had a, a manager called Jock McCosh, who I think is the most Scottish name you can come with since Hamish Macbeth. Um, so he was their their manager, he played, he had played for Air United. Um, it's an interesting one, they they won. That one of those forties triumphs was based with a team with all Dublin players, uh, and they pointed out the fact that the only non-Dubliners involved were Jock McCosh, who's Scottish, obviously, and and William Hunter, who was from Belfast. But at a time when there was a lot of uh, uh, players being brought in from from Britain uh, to you know play for the likes of Shelburne or Shamrock Rovers or whatever, Drums won the cup with uh, an all Dublin, never mind an all Ireland, an all Dublin selection. So Mark says, uh, no question, just as I would have been in talk, thanks to us and all involved. Lots of interesting facts and a great history, so well presented. Dermot says, I believe it was the Tyrrells from Grace Park Road who got permission from the Proles to use the Drumcondra FC name in 1981. I played for that schoolboy team, great memories. 
Tommy says, also, I am a Bose fan. You're not your own, Jerry. Uh, my dad was born in Norfolk Road, Fisborough, hence the Bose connection. And he played with Bunny Fulham. Yeah, uh, great stories about Bunny as well. And he's one of those players that anyone I talked to from that era, um, like obviously a very tough player, uh, very tough tackling. He was kind of full back. But uh, what people don't kind of really realise about Bunny is he was probably a bet better player than sometimes he's given credit for. And the fact that he was a great set-piece taker, great for free kicks and penalties and scored a lot of goals for the club as well for, for a fullback. Uh, John says, very enjoyable. I'm Johnny Robinson's son. I was wondering, is there any film footage of the cup finals? Um, unfortunately, a lot of that stuff is is disappeared. And even from much later, um, I know for a fact, I say like Niall Shelley, who scored the winner for um, Bowes in the 76 final, his family have been looking for footage for that for years. Um, I will actually, I will see, I will see if I can find anything, but uh, the earlier ones were probably, uh, be f there might be some, some Pathé news real sort of stuff. And you can look at the, the Pathé website and you can search keywords like Drumcondor and Talk Park, you might find something. A lot of the RTE stuff, especially in the 60s, uh, was kind of not kept or, or not reused. And there was actually, um, there was frequent uh, arguments uh, if you look up Sam Pro, uh, one of the many committees he was on for the for the FAI was the television committee, which is about television and radio coverage. And they were constantly arguing with RTE about the coverage of the League of Ireland or lack thereof. So unfortunately, there's an awful lot of stuff that we just don't have recordings of. But uh, I will have a look around. And um, I just saying as well, if anyone wants to follow me on Twitter, it's at Jerry Tastic is uh, my handle. But I, I do kind of share a lot of stuff on League of Ireland history. So if I could find anything, I'll share it on there as well. And I might stick it up on the, on the blog post as well. And just on that, Jerry, I just got it. Anne says there that she has some TV footage and she'll send on to me. Uh, thanks a million, Anne. So it's from Condra Library at DublinCity.ie. <laughs> um, so Carl says, great talk, Jerry. My father lived on Richmond Road and was a great drums fan. I followed in his footsteps. I remember going down to talk at the watch Bobby Gilbert. What a great header of a ball. I also remember Gary Scothern playing for Jones Bowes against Santos in Daily Mount. That's one I actually should have as, mentioned as well, because uh, as we're saying, Drums were probably not doing so well in the, in the 1970s. As I said, they're finished towards the bottom of the league. Their, their finances weren't great. So, But a drum Condra bohemian combination in 1972 did take on Santos, complete with... The famous Pele and about you know four or five other Brazilian internationals in Daly Mount Park. Um, apparently, Big Martin had a great game uh, against uh, against Pele that day, and you know helped in his move to Man United thereafter. Uh, apparently, Pele didn't actually wasn't that great, and some people were a bit disappointed. But he did hang around afterwards and sign a load of autographs. I also did read one other story, uh, an interview with Bunny Fulham from years back about when they were coming back from one of their European trips. I think it might have been the game against Nuremberg. And they stopped off in Amsterdam at a time when Santos were playing a friendly there. And he actually got to meet Pele then as well. So there's a couple of Pele connections with drums. But yeah, it is worth saying that some of the drums players did actually play against Santos and Pele in 72 uh, towards the end of their existence. Uh, Tommy says his neighbours are related to Billy Bean and Jim O'Mara, former drums player. David's wondering if you have any idea how or when the Hunters came to be involved in the club. Uh, the Hunters were the early 1930s, so um, the, uh, I'm trying to think now, so 19, so basically the, it becomes a public uh, company in 1929, and quickly enough thereafter the Hunters become involved, so I'm thinking it's like 31, 32, around that era. Certainly by the end of the 30s, they're being referenced regularly, so um, I'd say early, mid-1930s would be my, my estimate based on my research. Stevens, congratulate you on the talk, but he's wondering how long John Whelan played for drums as he was awarded a testimonial versus Man United. Yeah, um, the John Whelan, for those who aren't familiar, is the brother of Liam Whelan. And um, I'm nearly sure that uh, John, uh, that testimonial match was the first match Man United played after they had won the 1968 European Cup. So Matt Busby, as a kind of a, a gesture towards the Whelan family brought the entire Man United League and European Cup winning side to, to, to Dublin to play that game for John Whelan. Uh, I'm not sure the exact duration of his career, but usually if you got a testimonial, it was a minimum of 10 years. Uh, Jerry says, a great talk and very informative. My father, Joe Maloney, played fullback in the 40s, along with my uncle Peter Keogh, who was goalkeeper there around the same time. 
and Steve is saying home farm changed in the name a number of times from home farm to home farm, Everton to home farm, Fingless. They eventually became Dublin City in 2001, so arguably that is the year they ceased to be in the league. So in reality, they had already left when home farm Everton became a thing. Yeah, the, the Dublin uh, City one, yeah, I mean, that was um, an interesting event. So, yeah, I suppose Dublin City really bought out the home farm's place in the league and that rebranding happens and home farm really went back to just being a junior club and focusing on you know on that side of things um yeah so that that's probably the, the best answer i can give yeah that, that that's a fair point that the, the the dublin city kind of taking their place in the league uh which was which was fun uh you had you know roddy collins in as manager they were signed gave him carl palmer out of retirement efna koku all these lads playing for them mad stuff and uh, Paul just gave a link there to boxing in Tolka Park. And uh, that's the last of 30 uh, questions that you <laughs> fielded. Well done, you. And that's a nice link as well into, uh, again, congratulating you on a great talk. Thanks, Jerry. And just remind people that that recording will be available after the 10th of um, October, hopefully at some stage. Um, keep an eye on our Facebook account, Jim Condra Library, um, and as I say, give Jerry a follow as well. Uh, he also does um, uh, various podcasts on his uh, blog there. You can see the, the link. And just to say that we are kind of hoping to, you know, reinstate events on site in Jim Condra once restrictions lift. Um, you know, we'd prefer to have these events on site because uh, we find the value, the added value in the questions and then people get to talk to each other and when we did the APO event a lot of ex-players turned up which was really lovely um, so hopefully we'll be able to look at that and we were just chatting about a program of potential events um, and Jerry does have an interest in in boxing as well I wrote a very interesting article there on boxing in daily mount which you may want to have a look at too on his blog so that's it Jerry for the evening well done you it's time to go get a cup of tea and uh you know, I just want to say thanks to everyone for all the questions and feedback and stories as well. It's great to hear.